than a once and for all occurrence. It takes great discipline, personal sacrifice, and commitment to continue to pay a bill for years and years, but we can regain our self-respect only by following through. Most of us find making amends for the damage we did in intimate relationships to be extremely uncomfortable. As we wrote our fourth step, we realized that we not only robbed ourselves of the chance for meaningful relationships, we also caused deep emotional wounds in our partners. Our fears of intimacy or commitment may have led us to use, be unfaithful to, or abandon the people who loved us. We were generally unavailable to those people. While there are times when we need to approach such people with our amends, there are other times when it is best to leave them alone so as not to reopen old wounds. Knowing the difference requires complete honesty on our part and open communication with our sponsor. Whether or not we make direct amends to the people we've harmed in relationships, we definitely need to change the way we behave in our relationships today. If we ran from intimacy before, we need to sit down and learn to communicate with our partners. We must become more considerate, sensitive, and attentive to the needs of others. Sometimes, the only way you can make amends is to change the way you live. As discussed in the 8th step, we may owe amends to our community or society as a whole. Though this may seem to be an abstract concept, we must make concrete amends by changing our behavior. If we harm society, we start to make amends by becoming a productive member of society. We contribute, we look for ways to give, not take. Our recovery is also a way of making amends to ourselves. We treated ourselves horribly in our act of addiction. The guilt and shame we felt each time we harmed another human being took quite a toll on our self-respect. Our addiction humiliated us in a thousand different ways. Now, in recovery we learn to treat ourselves in ways that demonstrate our self-respect. The most important results of the ninth step will be found within ourselves. This step teaches us a great deal about humility, love, selflessness, and forgiveness. We begin to heal from our addiction and no longer live with as many regrets. We grow spiritually and find that we are truly gaining a new level of freedom in our lives. Our past is just that, the past. We have put it behind us so that it no longer hovers on the edge of our thoughts, waiting for a chance to haunt our present. One of the most wonderful gifts we derive from working the ninth step is the knowledge that we are becoming better human beings. We realize how much we have changed because we are now 42. Longer doing the things for which we are making amends. We may not have realized how much we had changed in our recovery until now. The amends process drives home the knowledge that we are becoming truly different people. The extended nightmare of our addiction is finally beginning to fade in the dawning light of our recovery. Our humility increases as we face the people we have harmed. The impact of realizing how deeply our actions have affected other people shocks us out of our self-obsession. We begin to understand that other people have real feelings and that we are capable of hurting them if we are careless. We learn about being considerate of other people as we work this step, and what we learn is what we practice in our lives today. It becomes natural for us to think before we speak or act, keeping in mind that what we say or do is going to affect our friends, our families, and our fellow non-members. 
We approach people with love and kindness, carrying within ourselves a deep and abiding respect for the feelings of others. Because of the humility and selflessness so necessary in making our amends, you may be surprised at the way Step 9 enhances our self-esteem. One of the most paradoxical aspects of our recovery is that by thinking of ourselves less, we learn to love ourselves more. We may not have expected our spiritual journey to lead to a fresh appreciation of ourselves, but it does. Because of the love we extend to others, we realize our own value. We learn that what we contribute makes a difference, not just in Na but in the world at large. As a result of working the ninth step, we are free to live in the present, able to enjoy each moment and experience gratitude for the gift of recovery. Memories of the past no longer hold us back, and new possibilities appear. We are free to go in directions we never considered before. We are free to dream and to pursue the fulfillment of our dreams. Our lives stretch out before us like a limitless horizon. We may stumble from time to time, but the tenth step gives us the opportunity to pick ourselves up and keep walking forward. Our higher power has given us an invitation to live, and we accept it with gratitude. Step 10. 43. We continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong promptly admitted it. Recovery in Narcotics Anonymous is about learning how to live. Incorporating the spiritual principles we learned in the first nine steps into our lives has made it possible to live in harmony with ourselves and others. Self-examination, confronting what we find in ourselves, and owning up to our wrongs are critical elements of conducting our lives on a spiritual basis. By working the tenth step, we become more aware of our emotions, our mental state, and our spiritual condition. As we do, we find ourselves constantly rewarded with fresh insights. Some of us look back at our fourth step and wonder why we have to do a tenth step. We may think that we've corrected all our past mistakes in the previous step, since we have no intention of making those mistakes again, why should we continue with this relentless self-examination? The tenth step seems like a tiresome chore to some of us, a painful exercise that we could just as well avoid. But we must continue to grow, and that's exactly what the tenth step helps us do. Though we will return to the previous steps again and again, the tenth step furthers our spiritual healing in a different way. By creating an awareness of what's going on in our lives today. The importance of keeping in touch with our thoughts, attitudes, feelings, and behavior cannot be overemphasized. Every day, life presents us with new challenges. Our recovery depends on our willingness to meet those challenges. Our experience tells us that some members relapse, even after long periods of clean time, because they have become complacent in recovery, allowing their resentments to build and refusing to acknowledge their wrongs. Little by little, those small hurts, past truths, and justified grudges turn into deep disappointment serious self-deception, and full-blown resentment. We can't allow these threats to compromise our recovery. We have to deal with situations such as these as soon as they arise. In the tenth step, we use all the principles and actions we learned in the previous steps, applying them to our lives on a consistent basis. 
beginning our days by reaffirming our decision to live life according to our higher powers will has helped many of us keep spiritual ideals foremost in our minds throughout the day. Even so, we are bound to make mistakes that are very familiar to us. We can attribute virtually every wrongdoing to a character defect we identified in the sixth step. Humbly asking the God of our understanding to remove our shortcomings is just as necessary now as it was in the seventh step. In the tenth step, we take such actions on a regular basis. Each day, we take our own inventory look for those times when we fall short of our spiritual ideals, and renew our efforts to live a principle-centered life. For example, when we are faced with the tendency to behave compulsively, ignoring the consequences of our actions, we need to focus on spiritual principles, take prompt action, and continue forward in our recovery. Although forming a habit of working this step may be difficult at first, we must persist. We can set aside some time during the day for focused self-appraisal while gradually moving toward a goal of being able to look at ourselves throughout the day. We keep going forward, striving each moment to become ever more aware of ourselves. We need to develop self-discipline. The more effort we put into doing so, the more we'll find that working the 10th step will become as natural as breathing. 44. Not that we should be hard on ourselves, picking at our every motive and looking for problems where none exist. We need to stay in tune with the voice of our conscience and listen to what it's telling us. When we get a nagging feeling that something isn't quite right, we should pay attention to it. If our feelings of guilt or anger seem to go on for a long time, we can do something about them. We know when something is bothering us perhaps not immediately, but usually not too long after the fact. As soon as we become aware that we're feeling ill at ease, we search out the cause and deal with it as soon as possible. While we strive to maintain ongoing awareness throughout the day, it is also helpful to sit down at the end of each day and quietly reflect on what has happened and how we responded to it. Often, our sponsor will suggest that we write out our 10th step. We may also make use of our informational pamphlet, moving the program. In this step, we ask ourselves the same types of questions we asked in the fourth step. The only difference is that the emphasis is on today. We look at our current behavior and ask ourselves if we are living by our values. Am I being honest today? Am I maintaining personal integrity in my relations with others? Am I growing, or am I slipping back into old patterns? We concentrate on the overall picture of our day. In order to examine our day or our life, for that matter in its entirety, we have to draw on the humility we required in the previous steps. We have learned quite a bit about ourselves, how we've responded to life in the past and how we want to respond to life now. It takes a great deal of awareness to humbly acknowledge our part in our own lives. We may have trouble knowing when we are wrong simply because we usually intend to be right. For instance, at some point in our recovery we may attend a group business meeting firmly convinced that we know what the group should do. We've studied all sides of the issue. We forcefully share our views at the meeting. We're so convinced of our rightness that we fail to recognize our self-righteousness. We are blind to the harm we're causing others by not respecting their views as much as our own. 
Often we act in ways that are contrary to our values, yet we expect others to live up to our standards. For instance, we may find ourselves flinching when we hear others gossiping about someone. Following such an occurrence, we are likely to be self-righteous until we catch ourselves doing the very same thing. Other situations can occur when we become supercritical of others. For example, we may have a tendency to have high expectations of others. However, we have a variety of excuses at hand for why these standards don't apply to us. If we find ourselves in the midst of such moral uncertainty, we can use the principles of the tenth step to provide more clarity. There may be other times in our lives when we find ourselves in a situation that seems to require a compromise of our personal beliefs and values. For instance, if we had gained employment at a company only to discover that our employer expected us to indulge in questionable business practices, we could reasonably expect to feel confused about the choices available to us. Deciding what to do about such a difficult dilemma would be a tough decision for any one of us. We may be tempted to make a snap judgment or expect our sponsor to provide an easy answer. However, we have found that no one can solve such a dilemma for us. While our sponsor will provide us with guidance, we must apply the principles of the program for ourselves and arrive at our own decision. In the end, we are the ones who must live with our conscience. In order to do so comfortably, we must decide what is, and what is not, morally acceptable in our lives. 45. It can be very confusing to determine when we were wrong, especially when we're right in the middle of a conflict. When our emotions are running high, we may not be able to take an honest look at ourselves. We can see only our immediate wants and needs. At such times, our sponsor may suggest that we take a personal inventory on a particular area of our lives so that we can see our part. If our friends notice that we're acting on a character defect, they may suggest that we talk to our sponsor about it. Being open-minded to the suggestions of our sponsor and our not friends, paying attention to what our conscience is telling us, spending some quiet time with the God of our understanding all these things will lead us to greater clarity. Once we're aware that we've been wrong whether it's five minutes, five hours, or five days after the fact we need to admit our error as soon as possible and correct any harm we've caused. As in the ninth step, we find that the process of admitting our mistakes and changing our behavior brings about tremendous freedom. Of course, we must be just as careful when amending our current behavior as we were when we made amends in the ninth step. For instance, if we find that we were wrong because we sat in a meeting silently judging someone who shared, we certainly don't need to go tell that person what we were thinking. Instead, we can make an effort to be more tolerant. We must remember that the tenth step isn't a one-sided endeavor, an exercise in noting what we have done wrong. We must resist any urge to become obsessive with this step, ruthlessly searching out every flaw in our character. The point of the tenth step is for us to be willing to pay attention to our thoughts, behaviors, and values, then work on what we need to change. We should acknowledge that, quite often, our motives are good and we do things right. Character defects and character assets do not exclude each other, and we are sure to find both on any given day. 
We develop recovery-oriented goals for ourselves as we work this step. When we see that we've been afraid to go forward in a particular area of our lives, we can resolve to take a few risks, drawing our courage from our higher power. When we see that we've been selfish, we can strive to become more generous in the future. When we realize today that we've fallen short in any area of our lives, we don't have to be overwhelmed by feelings of dread and fear of failure. Instead, we can be grateful for our self-awareness and begin to feel a sense of hope. We know that, by applying our program of recovery to our shortcomings, we will change and grow. We begin to see ourselves more realistically as a result of working the 10th step. Many of us have remarked on the freedom we experience through freely admitting our mistakes and releasing ourselves from unrealistic expectations. Where before we went from one extreme to another, either feeling better than everyone else or feeling worthless, we now find the middle ground where true self works can flourish. We feel renewed hope as we uncover long neglected assets in this step. We see ourselves as we really are, accepting our good qualities along with our defects, knowing we can change with the help of a higher power. We are becoming what we were meant to be all along, full human beings. Although all of us need the love and attention of others, that doesn't mean we must depend on people to provide what we can only find within ourselves. We can stop making unreasonable demands on others and begin to give of ourselves in relationships. Our romantic relationships, our friendships, and our interactions with family members, co-workers, and casual acquaintances are undergoing an astounding change. We are free to enjoy another's companions just because we're no longer so obsessed with ourselves. We finally see that all the devices we use to keep. 46. Other people away are unnecessary at best and, more often than not, are the underlying cause of the pain we suffer in our relationships. Healthier relationships are just one indication that the quality of our lives has improved dramatically. Such indications merely reflect the intangible but very real changes that have taken place inside us. Our entire outlook has changed. Compared to the spiritual values we hold here today, concerns such as looking good or amassing material wealth pale in significance. By accepting the challenge of self-appraisal called for in the 10th step, we discovered that we value our recovery and our relationship with the God of our understanding above all else. As the inner chaos that we lived with for so long subsides, we begin to experience long periods of serenity. During these times, we experience the powerful presence of a loving God in our lives. We are increasingly conscious of that power and are ready to search for ways to maintain and improve our contact with it. Seeking direction and meaning for our lives, we go on to the 11th step. Step 11. 47. We sought through prayer avid meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us avid the power to carry that out. Throughout our recovery, one of the things which stands out as a result of our working the steps is our success in building a relationship with the God of our understanding. Our initial efforts resulted in the decision we made in the third step. We continued by working the following steps, each one of which were designed to clear away whatever barriers might stand between our higher power and ourselves. 
As a result, Neo opened to receive our higher powers love and guidance directly into our lives. For many of us, the characteristics of our disease and the things we did in our active addiction separated us from our higher power. Our self-obsession made it difficult for most of us to even believe in a power greater than ourselves, much less achieve conscious contact with that power. We could see no purpose or meaning in our lives. Nothing could begin to fill the emptiness we felt. It seemed as though we shared no common bond with others at all. We felt alone in a vast universe, believing nothing existed beyond what our limited view allowed us to see. However, once we begin to recover, we find our obsession with ourselves diminishing and our awareness of the presence of a higher power growing. We've begun to see that we aren't alone and never have been. Through working the previous steps, we have already achieved a conscious contact with the God of our understanding. Our separation and isolation have ended. In the eleventh step, we now seek to improve our conscious contact with the God of our understanding through prayer and meditation. Many of us had trouble understanding the meaning of praying for power in the eleventh step. At first glance, this seemed to contradict the most basic aspect of our recovery program, our admission of powerlessness. But if we take another look at the first step, we'll see that it says we were powerless over our addiction, not that we won't be given the power to carry out the will of the God of our understanding. We did begin at a point of powerlessness in the first step, we were powerless over our addiction and incapable of carrying out any will but our own. This doesn't mean we gain power over our addiction in the 11th step. In the 11th step, we pray for a particular kind of power, the power to carry out God's will. We no longer shy away from spiritual growth because it has become so essential to maintaining the peace of mind we found. Perhaps at the beginning of our recovery we worked the steps because we were in pain and afraid we would relapse if we didn't. But today we are motivated less by pain and fear, driven more by our longing for continued recovery. This leaning toward recovery reveals that we've surrendered more completely. We've reached a state where we actually believe that the will of a power greater than ourselves is better for us than our own will. It has become second nature for us to ask ourselves what our higher power would have us do in our lives rather than attempting to manipulate situations so they happen according to our ideas of what's best. We no longer see God's will for us as something we have to endure. On the contrary, we make a conscious effort to align our will with our higher powers, believing that we'll gain more happiness and peace of mind by doing so. This is what surrender is. A heartfelt belief in our own fallibility as human beings and an equally heartfelt. 48. Decision to rely on a power greater than our own. Surrender, the stumbling block of our addiction, has become the cornerstone of our recovery. However, we cannot recover on surrender alone. We must build on our surrender by taking action, just as we have in the previous steps. In the tenth step, we began to practice the discipline required to live spiritually on a daily basis. We continue practicing this principle in the 11th step by persisting in our efforts to take action each day. We place prayer and meditation high on our priority list. We resolve to make prayer and meditation as much a part of our daily routine as eating and sleeping, and then we employ the necessary self-discipline to achieve our resolve. 
to work this step, we must also increase the courage we developed in the previous step. Though the courage we demonstrated when we honestly and thoroughly examined ourselves was beyond anything we had previously experienced, we now